Welcome to LFG with JJ, the podcast that helps you level up your CX game by navigating CX and AI technologies. I'm Juan J. Singh, the CEO of Zingtree, the AI-powered customer experience platform providing solutions that turn every human into an expert. 700 plus companies across 54 countries trust our solutions to boost their contact center proficiency, enable their customers to self-help, improve their internal processes, and more with Zingtree. Mike Jennings, welcome to LFG, LFG with JJ. Excited to have you here on the podcast. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. I'm excited to be here, JJ. Although it's the afternoon here in the UK. That's correct. Good afternoon. Great to see you. I'm, you know, Mike Jennings is the VP of UK Operations at Fleet Corps. I, and... Um, Let's get started right, right about who Mike Jennings is. You know, what is your background? Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, who, who is Mike Jennings. <laughs> uh, Mike Jennings has had uh, quite a, a diverse background. So um, I've had a whole lot of different jobs, JJ. So um, right back to McDonald's where I lasted about three weeks, um, all the way to uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, which I saw as a promotion at the time. Um, <laughs> working in a few different industries before I found my... Uh, my calling and uh, quite a interesting journey on the way, many twists and turns uh, to find myself now as, as vice president of uh, UK operations here at Fleet Corps. That's amazing. So you were working at McDonald's and then you went to KFC. Uh, what were you doing there? I'm curious. I was like the uh, chicken nugget expert at McDonald's. Like I, I somehow, <laughs> I somehow able to scoop six at a time every time perfectly. So, so you were making nuggets and then what? Then you switched to KFC. And you were, you you were staying loyal to chicken. I was, I was. Chickens, chickens stay close to my heart even uh, twenty years later. So uh, some things never change. Uh, that's a unique, unique background, I, and how you got to where you are. So I'm sure there was you know, over the last twenty years there was a you know interesting path in your professional career to get to where you are. Um, the question I have for you is. Uh, obviously, you continue to you know keep growing and learning and keep advancing in your career. But when was the time? Was there a moment in time in your early part of your professional career? Um, you know, maybe it was during McDonald's, KFC, or right after, where you felt like, "Hey, I found my career path. I found uh, you know the opportunity where I know I can make it, or you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna make it." When did you have that feeling? Um. I'll be perfectly honest, I don't think in my life I've ever had that feeling yet because I always want more and I always want to do better. Um, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do, but I've always known what I didn't want to do. And I think by having kind of a lot of different experiences and working at different places and working for a lot of different people, um, you don't necessarily kind of have a, a defined or never really had a defined career path. Um, I went to university and I got a business degree. Um, I always wanted to be a professional soccer player, but that was never going to happen uh, because I'm not good enough. It took me a few years to accept that. And I guess I was kind of fairly laid back about the situation. But one thing that I've always tried to do and and tried to be is the best at what I can be, whatever job I'm doing. So whether that was working at McDonald's, I wanted to be the best chicken nugget scooper uh, in the whole company. Um, When I moved into another role um, and then I started kind of moving into office work, you know, I used to work in a contact center and I wanted to make sure I was the best contact center agent. And then I became a team leader and I never in a million years thought I'd be a team leader, but I wanted to be the best team leader. And so I guess my kind of internal uh, competitiveness just always drove me to try to learn off those around me um, to, you know, improve on a daily basis and and to reflect on my mistakes and to more than anything, be happy Um, because a lot of people are in jobs that they're not happy with. And so I guess my two, uh, driving emotives were a always be better than yesterday and b always be happy and proud in what you do that's amazing that's an amazing perspective um it's uh that you know uh being grateful for what you have and trying to be the best at it and having that competitive drive i uh, can definitely take you places and i i see that it's served you very well uh, that's amazing i uh, and you you know uh progress your career at experience and then you continue to progress your career uh, you know, outside of Experian now, uh, how has that journey been on uh, uh, when you, you know, uh, we'd love to learn about like how you got came into the Experian workforce and how that, you know, journey progressed and to where you are now? Yeah, sure. No problem. So I'll just take a step back. So um, before Experian, I used to work for one of the biggest banks in the UK. 
Um, prior to that, I just left a job and my parents were very, very old school that you didn't leave one job until you got another job. <laughs> and I was too scared to tell them that I'd left. So yeah. um, every day for six months, I used to put on my suit, get on the bus no. and, sit, <laughs> and sit in a pub, no word of a lie. And uh, I had no money, no anything. And um, where would you go when you left, left home? When you got on the bus, you would go hang out where? Just in the pub for local Weatherspoons. Oh, in the pub, um, yeah. Just, anyone who knows the UK is like the dingiest pub in the UK. You can get like any drink for a dollar. And uh, it's not a great place to be, especially every day for six months. And um, I was playing on this kind of quiz machine in the pub and I felt like a hand on my shoulder. And I turned around and it was an old school friend who I'd not seen in years. Yeah. And he was like, hey, I've just been at a jobs fair across the road. I'm like, what, a jobs fair? And uh, he goes, yeah, you should check it out. And I went and um, this, this bank um, were recruiting for their contact center. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough to kind of get offered a job on the spot. I remember now it was uh, a basic salary of 12,000 pounds a year. So about $15,000 a year, which I was super excited about because it worked out at a thousand pounds a month, which I'd never kind of earned before. Yeah. And uh, I went in and uh, started kind of taking phone calls, was lucky enough to be made a team leader a team manager and then a section manager and then became head of operations. Um, it was around this time when the banking crisis happened and the bank I was working for got taken over by another bank. However, the debt that my bank was in um, then almost brought down another bank. So the government had to step in and, and kind of buy 40% of the company. And as part of kind of like the cost cutting measures, they decided they were going to close down the office which I was working in. Um, I was pretty kind of upset at the time because, you know, I really did enjoy what I was doing and I love the people. Um, but then I got kind of given an opportunity to work in sales, um, sales with a bank. And I did that for a period of time and, and you know, was, was really successful in it, fortunately. However, I didn't like it. It didn't make me happy. It didn't kind of inspire me as such. And I was kind of, you know, vaguely looking for, for an opportunity. And in the meantime, my old director from the bank had actually moved across to Experian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a call off Sue, uh, Sue O'Hagan, who I owe so very much to in my career. And she said, hey, Mike, you know, we've got a role and we think you'd be really good for it. Um, I took a look and, and was lucky enough to get the role. And I did that for a period of time, which was basically running kind of the, the contact center um, on all things kind of customer service led. Uh, we had some great success and, and kind of within 18 months, we'd been crowned the European uh, customer service department of the year, which was, which was a fantastic achievement. That's amazing. Uh, verified as the best of what we did in Europe and uh, did that. And I'd always kind of had a burning desire to work abroad, to travel with my role. And an opportunity came up to work more in a global role within the kind of global audit function. And I moved away to that for, for two years. I was lucky enough to work in, in many different countries around the world. So, um, Australia, China, India, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, most of Europe and, and the US quite a lot as well. And it was fantastic. And I learned so much about how different cultures worked, responded in certain situations. Sure. And started kind of um, shaping me quite a lot in, in my outlook, not just at work, but in life as well. Um, for anyone who's traveled pretty much solidly for two, three years, they know it's, it's exhausting and not necessarily sustainable. And so, you know, after a great time, I, I kind of thought now's the time to perhaps settle down a bit in the UK. Um, I was lucky enough to then move into a, a role which was kind of heading up the change and transformation, which is where we first came into contact with Zingtree. Yep. Um, never looked back, never been able to get rid of you since, JJ. <laughs> and uh, did that for a little bit. Um, had some great success kind of delivering some pretty big, big projects and new product features. Um, before then moving into a, a more operational role again, which kind of involved me running about 600 heads across uh, the UK, South Africa, and India. Yeah. Um, really, really enjoyed that. Experian was a great company to work for, and I owe so very much to them. However, you know, being super ambitious, I was looking for the next step in my career. It wasn't necessarily about immediate opportunity available Experian. So when the uh, VP role came up at Fleet Corps, um, I didn't... Uh, well, I didn't have to think twice about going towards it. Um, it's been about two years now and I'm still enjoying it. It's uh, a very different industry, a very different environment. 
but I literally learn so many new things each day. And that's what inspires me to keep learning and to keep evolving as a person, as an employee. Well, thank you for sharing your background, the details about your journey from Experian through Experian, uh, your time there, and then into Fleet Corps. Amazing story, inspirational. I, uh, you know, going to a pub for six straight months and not letting your parents <laughs> know that must have been, you know, extremely interesting times. And, uh, you know, I, I think we talked about how you take a step back before you move two steps forward. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, quite the, um, uh, you know, situation here. So amazing, amazing. You went through it and the journey you went through and the experience you had, uh, you know, in this, uh, uh, in this career that you've had is amazing. So thanks for sharing that, Mike. Um, no so, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting was you guys at Experian were uh, I, um, awarded the best uh, CX uh, customer success and customer experience uh, award in all of UK. That's pretty remarkable. And uh, all Europe. yeah, you know, in all of Europe. Sorry, my bad. Uh, all of Europe. Wow. So that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, so this this is a good uh, segue to our next section is about the state of the union of the CX state of the union of the CX industry. I uh, you've been in this industry for a long time. I, I didn't realize you were actually uh, on the front lines on in the trenches taking uh, customer support calls. So you've done it all. You've been there, done that. And uh, you've been rewarded for it. And you've been part of great teams that have been rewarded for it. Uh, where do you think the CX industry is now? And where do you think it's heading in the future? Yeah, I think um, the CX industry is a, a really interesting one because you get some fantastic examples of great CX and then you get some pretty poor examples of CX. And then you get organizations who, who think they're delivering CX, but really not delivering CX. And, yeah. and I think you know, we all see some great examples of, of kind of organizations out there who have perhaps <clears throat> invested in new technology, but are then not fully invested in embedding that technology. Um, you know, I saw a, a great example the other day where an organization had just invested loads of money in web chat and the, or sorry, a chat bot. Mm -hmm. And the chatbot was, you know, how can I help you today? The person replied saying, you know, I've been scammed. I've been defrauded of £10,000. Chatbot replied saying, oh, that's great. Question mark, exclamation mark. <laughs> because the AI hadn't been, you know, atoned to actually match what the customer sentiment was. And I, and I think, you know, when we talk about the direction of CX, it's undoubtedly a direction of actually making it easier for consumers to get the outcome that they need, to get to the person that they need. And in so many ways, technology can help with that. But if technology isn't delivered right in the right way and then embedded and optimized and learned and evolved, then, you know, ultimately you end up having completely the opposite effect from what you want. Now, the negative publicity on the back of this interaction is really poor for the customer yeah. and business, when in reality, if it was done right, it could have been the complete opposite of that. And, you know, what we're often seeing in, in, in customer experience and, and kind of on a more macro scale is that price is really, really important. You know, it is a key pain point and it is a key motivator for lots of individuals, but actually service is becoming just as big a differentiator as pricing. And, and often people would rather pay more for it to be done better, right, and correct first time. Mm -hmm. I think so many examples where um, businesses get that right, but I think there's equally as many examples where businesses get that wrong. Yeah. You can't just deliver a fundamental change and turn it on and then run a million miles and move on to the next change. Yeah. You have to spend a bit of time making sure that it's embedded throughout all levels of the environment, the culture, the workforce, and that everybody's bought into it and everybody's committed to it being that 1% better next week than it was a week before. Yep. Uh, wow. So uh, the comment you made was, you know, you believe that tech plays a major role in the, you know, currently in the CX industry and the future of the CX industry but how you vet the tech products that are out there, how do you implement them? How do you, you know, get them adopted and engaged uh, and empower your teams are critical and spending the time and energy the right way to do it, um, uh, you know, uh, gives a lot of uh, positive outcomes. Uh, and if you don't do that, uh, you have, uh, you know, pitfalls and, uh, you know, losses are coming your way. So that's um, uh, really good insights there. Uh, funny about the comment about the chatbot you said where someone lost 10,000 pounds and the chatbot said, hey, you know, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to be that consumer. <laughs> no, definitely not. And I think, you know, the, the, the other thing kind of just to reiterate that is that nobody, but nobody in the world 
well, maybe one or two people in the world yeah. uh, wakes up in the morning and say, hey, today I'm going to call up a contact center and I'm really, really excited to do so. <laughs> because by the, time, by the time someone has picked up a phone or had to send an email, something has normally gone wrong to prompt that interaction. Yes. And so actually, you know, the self-serve capability is so important to customers to have to, you know, time is a commodity and time is precious to so many people yep. where if you're working, you know, a typical nine to five job and you get an hour long lunch, you yep. don't want to spend your lunch break having to, you know, wait in a queue for a query that you could have done online, or you don't want to spend your evening, but you could spend with your family, your friends, your children, um, yep. doing the same. And so actually preventing that first interaction is, is becoming you know, so key and get into that root cause of actually what has gone wrong to prompt a customer to pick up a phone to contact me, but yes. we're not able to do online. Yeah, it's interesting, right? We're in the, you know, B2B, you know, world of business, in the business world, but the people we service at the end of the day, whether, you know, uh, who are people that you work with or, you know, the, you know, customers that you're uh, supporting, they, at the end of the day, they're, they're humans, they're consumers. Uh, so we very much live in a, you know, B2C world as well, even though we're in the B2B world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's um, uh, quite interesting. So, yeah, I, you know, I, as we were talking about the CX industry, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your current job, uh, Mike. I, you know, you guys at Fleetcore are doing a lot of cool things, a lot of great things. I, you know, you're continuing to always innovate. I, I see you're very active in the M&A space. I, you know, you're making a lot of investments. Uh, in the EV space. Uh, so I'd love to just learn a little bit more about, you know, your specific job as, you know, VP of you know, UK operations, uh, you know, with um, your day-to-day -day role and, you know, how, you know, you've been able to do what you do every day. You know, what is the, you know, tech stack that you use? Um, hopefully Zintree has been helping you. You know, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your day-to-day -day, um, role at Fleetcore. Yeah, of course. So um, as VP of operations, um, it's a very broad role. So, um, for those of you who kind of aren't aware, um, B2B, uh, you know, effectively B2B payments um, is, you know, a core part of what Fleetcore does, you know, and a major part of that is within the fuel card industry. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of as, as part of my role, it can be very, very varied, right, from kind of dealing with the customer queries that come in, um, any kind of technical issues that might arise kind of amongst our network, um, expanding our kind of product uh, offering into the electric vehicle space. Um, so we're trying to build up our, our network there, which we've more than doubled in the last 12 months. Um, we kind of look after a lot of the customer self-serve platforms and the product kind of development within them and the feature development, um, right through to kind of ordering fuel, delivering fuel, supplying fuel and selling fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, you know, we can uh, work really closely with, with the sales teams to make sure that, you know, once kind of new business is coming in, it's being set up in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, see the sooner that, that the new business is set up and kind of put through the system and may receive their ability to transact the sooner you keep you know uh, get the revenue in and and, and ultimately um lots of things in between so there's a cliche that no two days are the same in operations and i can safely say that it is true um okay. we do always look to do things better um and you know none of this would be possible without trying to create an awesome team and an awesome culture because you can have the best product in the world. You can have the best tech stack in the world. But if you don't have a motivated team behind you and a team that's all pulling the right direction, it can be really difficult to deliver the results. So I try to spend a lot of my time with the people, understanding what their barriers are, understanding what their you know, key concerns are. And, and ultimately, you know, our frontline guys, they're our shop window. They're the, they're the team that speaks to our customers on a daily basis. And... Yeah. The insight you can get from them is, is far greater than, than anyone else, simply because they live it, they breathe it, they see it on a daily basis. So does it help you because you've been there, done that? You've been the frontline guy, you know, early on in your career. So when you go Absolutely. interact with your frontline people, you know, I'm assuming, you know they, they respect you, they respect your experience. Uh, you know, how does that interaction work when you spend time with your frontline folks? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to think it does help because I genuinely know how challenging it can be to be, um, you know, working in a contact center sometimes, taking 100 calls a day, um, you know, 60 Most of those. people are pissed off you when they get on the phone. Yeah, you know, 60 of those calls working. people shouting at you. Um, yeah. You know, nobody calls up a contact center to say thank you. People call yeah, here's, here's a question for you. What is one of the most challenging calls you've taken in your career? You know, Ooh. was there? 
<laughs> Wait, maybe you wanted to hang up, or maybe maybe you wanted to you know say not so nice nice things on the phone. <laughs> uh, I won't go into too much detail, but when I first joined the contact center, I uh, I used to work in uh, the drainage team, so it's for, for home insurance claims. Yeah. And uh, if there's a problem with your drainage system, yeah, they used to call us up and say, "Hey, uh, there's a problem with my drainage system." <laughs> And I remember there was one case that had been dealt with horrendously, really, really badly. And, and basically somebody's drains had been blocked for about three, four months with um, exactly what you can imagine drains get blocked with. Yeah. And uh, they, they sent me a photo um, as I was on the phone by email and I was nearly sick. Uh, <laughs> it was challenging because, you know, what could you do? I, I couldn't justify the way that that had been handled before I'd been able to speak to them. Yeah. The only thing I could change was to kind of give the customer the confidence that I was going to get onto this right now and get it sorted. Um, so, you know, within a couple of hours, we've been able to organize kind of alternative accommodation for them. Uh, we've been able to kind of get a specialist team out there to, you know, to, to, to clean the drains and to, to repair the damage. Um, you know, but this was a, this was a person whose, whose family was in a state of desperation. The kids were getting sick from, yeah. the, from the fumes and from the germs and I got my head ripped off. I got my head absolutely ripped off. But, you know, I can understand why, because... Yeah. And you stayed was... calm. You stayed calm during this process and you were able to get the... I, I, I perhaps was a little more, um, less calm back in those days. Um, but I did try to keep level-headed and, and remember how I'd probably feel if I was in, in that position as well. Yeah. Well, you know, it's amazing, you know, uh, for folks like us, now that we're, you know, really spending a lot of time with you know, in the in the contact center space with uh, customer support reps, uh, you really have more empathy for those people. Uh, and, you know, they're they're not coming in to work to say, "Hey, I'm gonna you know not provide someone help today. I'm gonna you know screw someone today." They're coming in because they have empathy, they care, they want to you know pr pr provide a you know a service and um, you know resolve issues. Uh, but sometimes. I, um, you know, they may not um, have the right information. They may not uh, know some of the right information um, and maybe they haven't trained well, for whatever reason, uh, they may not have the right, you know, be able to solve that issue right on that spot. So, uh, you know, now when I call customer service, um, you know, I'm more empathetic uh, to the person on the other line. Uh, and, and of course I do ask them, hey, are you using Zinctree or what other text, text <laughs> are you using? <laughs> So it's uh, it's quite an interesting conversation, but yeah, I mean, having that calmness and uh, empathy is critical. And uh, I think more and more people, as they learn about this industry, are empathetic towards the people on the other line on the phone who are trying to resolve their issues. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So I on your uh, you know in your day to day job, like what and how do you look at like you know tech stack, like the tech stack that you use? How do you use technology? How do you bet technology? You're talking about how important that is. I, yeah. you know, I, how, how, you know, how do you as a leader set the tone, I, I, for your organization to make sure that, you know, in your customer experience, you know, space, uh, that you guys are, you know, doing everything and also, you know, successes, but also learnings, you know, I would love to learn a little bit more about some of the big successes you've had and also some of the learnings you've had that has helped you continue to move forward in your day-to-day -day job. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, if we kind of look at our current tech stack, um, you know, we use Service Cloud as our, our kind of primary uh, CRM across the organization. And, uh, you know, beyond that, we, we use kind of various plugins within to Service Cloud with, with Zingtree being one, um, which we've seen some great success on. And I think, you know, ultimately, um, as the customer environment gets more complex, you know, there's more products, more processes, more procedures, more kind of pricing modules, so on and so forth. It's really important that the internal technology stack keeps up to date with that because if you've got um, a different platform for each product and a customer has five products, you know they're not interested in in you know how difficult it is for for us to navigate five different systems, five different screens. They just want an answer, quite rightly so. Yeah. And, and so a lot of it is kind of trying to make sure that we do have that consolidated three hundred and sixty view of a customer yeah. to make sure that we can make the right decisions and get the right resolution first time. Um, you know, a pet hate of mine is if I have to call up a, a bank or a utility company and they transfer me to one department who then transfers me to another department who then transfers me back into another department. And, and you know, the, the key thing there is making sure that each agent is skilled enough, uh, you know, using the likes of Zingtree as an example, to be able to uh, answer that query to the best of our ability first time. 
because yeah. nobody wants to be transferred around because it just prolongs the time, puts yeah. you in another queue, and then you have to explain your dilemma again, call to the next agent, which you've already yeah. just spent five minutes explaining. So there's a big kind of shift towards kind of getting it right first time and making sure that those guys who are at the very front end yeah. um, have the ability to be able to answer that query first time and not have to deflect it off to another area. That's great. Um, any, um, you know, anything that stands out for you, uh, whether at Fleet Corps in your career where, you know, you had some um, major challenges or, you know, tough times, uh, you know, I would love to, you know, hear a little bit about that as well. <laughs> um, I think, you know, a, a Fleet Corps change is, is generally done um, really well. So I wouldn't necessarily say there's, there's anything kind of it jumps out. I think, you know, a key learn for me throughout my career and probably kind of going back to my previous role at Experian would be when you move on to a new interface, um, going back to the point I raised earlier, you can't just plug it in, turn it on and tell everyone to get on with it. You know, you need those constant check-ins. So when we moved on to service clouds, as an example, or different iterations of service clouds, mm -hmm. um, you couldn't just say everyone, hey, today it's going to look a bit different. You need to spend time with the guys. You need to invest and embed and make sure that they understand that. And, and I think there's times, you know, certainly which I've learned from in the past where I perhaps haven't invested as enough time into embedding a new change yep. than, um, than I perhaps would have done and, and would do now. Yeah, that's an interesting comment, right? Because, you know, you're a leader and, you know, people follow you. Uh, but at the same time, we live in a world where, uh, in an age, it makes sense. Like, you can't just like, hey, do this, do that. You have to bring them along on the journey and tell them the why. Uh, and uh, and sometimes, you know, your views could be changed and could be different based on the feedback you get from your uh, team. So the collaboration piece, uh, you know, is critical and that's great. You've gone through that experience and, um, you know, you've learned from that. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, organizers, organizations in general aren't necessarily good at explaining the why. So we're really good at explaining what we're going to do. We're not so good um, at explaining the why we're going to do it. And, and this isn't necessarily organizational, it's, it's human beings in general. Yeah. People understand why something's happening. They generally understand it and that understanding drives tolerance. Yeah. And you get that, um, you know, coalition behind you, if you like, to, to drive that change forward 10 times quicker. People resent it more if you just said, right, we're going to do this, you've got to do it. Don't ask any questions because that div creates that divide. And so I just think it's so important to, to have that dialogue, to understand what's working, to understand what's not working, to be visible and to listen. But when you do listen, to act upon it as well. That's great. I'd uh, love to get to the next session, but I have to ask you one last question uh, you know, for Zingtree Nation. Uh, anything that Zingtree can do well as you're looking at you know, what's happening in the future and what, what your needs are, uh, not just at Fleet Corps, but in the CX industry, I, uh, you know, what would be your message to, you know, Zingtree Nation? Um, I think, you know, my, my message to the Zingtree Nation is you've got a, a fantastic product that I am truly, you know, as Zingtree, I, I, I completely buy into the product and I've benefited from it across, you know, two different organizations now um, because it's simple, it's easy and it produces the right results. In, in terms of, you know, advice to, to where Zingtree is heading in the future, you know, I'm really interested into, you know, stopping the, the challenges, stopping the cancellation, stopping the complaints before they even happen. So almost some kind of actionable insight into customer trends, customer behaviors mm -hmm. that almost allows us to predict which customers are going to be unhappy, complain, phone up, so that we can prevent it before it even occurs. Because a prevention is better than Yeah, so we're doing well on the reactive side, but the proactive before something happens, you know, you reaching out to the customer even before they call you, that would be pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's great insights. Um, Mike, this has been awesome, but let's get into some of your personal stuff. You've got a very unique background. Uh, and, and, you know, in, we live in a world now where professional and personal life are very much uh, interconnected. Uh, and I follow you on LinkedIn and I follow a lot of your posts on LinkedIn. And you've done an amazing job with this organization called Hike with Mike. And hopefully I'll get the invite one day to, you know, come hike with Mike. <laughs> but you've built this, you know, Hike with Mike Foundation. Um, it's just amazing watching uh, you do that, you know, uh, on, on the side and the impact you've made. Uh, and I think you started this a few year, years ago. Uh, and now I see you with all these amazing uh, uh, sponsors uh, and logos that are supporting your uh, mission. I uh, would love to learn a little bit more about, um, you know, the Hike with Mike Foundation. Yeah, sure. No problem. So, um, 
ultimately, um, it kind of started on the, on the back of some tragedy. So um, two of my close friends um, sadly decided to take their own life. And at the time, I'd kind of been really struggling to kind of rationalize it. You know, why, why would they do this? Um, and I, I struggled for answers, but I knew I'd kind of wanted to do something to help, except I couldn't help them, but I could potentially help others. I just wasn't sure what. Um, and then around about kind of um, lockdown time um, in the UK, I was kind of struggling a bit myself because every liberty and life I loved in terms of being able to go out to restaurants or football or to see my friends or to go outside, it just felt like it had been kind of taken away from me. Mm -hmm. And uh, there became a time where kind of uh, new rules got announced that you're allowed to go outside for a walk uh, like once a day. And I was so excited because I felt like a caged animal. And uh, I kind of spoke to, you know, started going out and, and speaking to my friends and, and they kind of would come along and we'd like have a pretty cool hiker and adventure. And then I kind of thought, you know, actually, I feel so much better for doing this, for being outside. And, you know, they did as well. And, and that was kind of my eureka moment that actually I could maybe combine the two, get yeah. people outside walking, hiking, benefiting from nature. Yes. And in doing so, maybe we could actually raise some money to help people who, who are struggling with their mental health. Yeah. Um, because here in the UK, we, we have the NHS, which is, you know, fantastic in many ways, but in, in, in other ways, it's massively underfunded. So what I did find out was that my friends who had been feeling mentally ill and did take their own life, they'd been trying to get help um, through their doctor, but were put on wow. waiting lists for three months and four months, respectively. Yeah. And telling somebody who is suicidal that they've got to wait three months for help just, just isn't right. And many people don't have that long to wait. So the premise of the, the Hike with Mike Foundation is that we do these, these hiking events um, normally once a month. And then a couple of times a year, we do bigger challenges. So for Three Peaks, as an example, which is kind of the biggest mountain in England, Scotland, and Wales. And then in June this year, we're actually doing our biggest challenge yet, which is uh, the 15 biggest mountains in Wales in 24 hours. So a massive, massive challenge. Um, what we do is we gain sponsorship through doing these extreme challenges. Uh, we work with kind of corporate organizations. We work with some generous individuals and all the money essentially goes into a pot and people who are struggling with their mental health, perhaps feeling suicidal, but can't get the help they need for the health service can come to us. And in 24 hours, we will fund 26 counseling sessions for them. Um, so literally kind of reducing that wait list by, by three, four months. Uh, we're paying for about 60 people to have help at the moment. Um, and we've got some amazing individuals. We've got somebody who's, you know, running marathons for us. Well, we've got a few people running marathons. We've got a guy who's uh, rowing the sea between uh, England and France. Uh, we've had people kind of do, do sleep outs, do, you know, shaving their hair, shaving their legs, all sorts. And um, we've also teamed up with some big organizations. So uh, Rolls Royce being one of them, Fleet Corps have been amazing, Experian were amazing. And we're kind of in a place now where um, we're helping a lot of people who, you know, maybe, and as difficult as it sounds, may may longer have been here if it wasn't for our intervention. So um, it's a real passion of mine being outside, going on adventures, but, but helping people as well. Wow, that's amazing! Congratulations on what you've done. You've made you know uh, an amazing impact. Um, it's phenomenal just hearing the story. Uh, hopefully, I'll get the invite to come on you know hike with Mike. I want to take on the three peaks. <laughs> right in between the end. At least I'll try. Uh, you know, I've got a competitive drive as well. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I'll also, you know, invite you to play pickleball with me. I'm going to bring my pickleball paddle next time I come come to the UK and uh, get yeah. you some pickleball action. Look forward to that. Um, what what else do you do when you're not, you know, in your in uh, in your day to day job? Like, what, you know, how do you you know take time off or? Um, have you played pickleball or what other hobbies do you have or is you know is it just work and hike with mike no so i haven't played pickleball yet but um i can't wait to see your face when i beat you <laughs> i love it <laughs> um, i'm sure you will absolutely batter me my confidence <laughs> is uh, misaligned here um so i'm a massive uh, football fan or, or soccer fan for uh for the american listeners um yeah. i support my local team nottingham forest and i'm lucky enough at the moment to live probably about thousand meters away from their stadium so uh, wow. it's an easy walk and we're in the premier league now which is making me very happy yeah so i spend a lot of time doing that i love my traveling um yeah. i love seeing new places and learning new things 
What, what uh, is something new that you're going to do soon? Any new places? Learn pickleball. Listening? Oh, go soon. I'm actually, uh, I actually want to see more of the Middle East and Croatia. Um, nice. so I'd love to see new places and learn new cultures. And, and that's something which I hope will never change. Yeah, that's awesome. Your story on uh, you know, going to visit all these countries through work. I, I'm sure also served you well as you're looking at, you know, I gave you the, uh, the juice, you got your juices flowing to go visit more and more new places. So uh, it's Definitely. exciting to always hear like how work and uh, personal life gets interconnected a lot. Um, so I know we're coming up on time. I want to uh, ask you one last question as we wrap up, Mike. Uh, yeah, sure. Amazing story, amazing background. And, uh, you know, uh, it's inspirational just listening to you speak. So thanks for sharing all this. But what advice would you give uh, to the younger generation who are looking to become, you know, uh, a leader in their space, in their industry, um, in CX? Uh, you know, what advice would you give to a uh, younger uh, Mike Jennings? <laughs> so, so I think it's a really good question. Think um, about the person who's, you know, doing, uh, you know, frying those um, uh, McNuggets at uh, <laughs> right? uh, What advice would you give uh, people who are looking to get their career going? Yeah. So, so I think society and social media, um, social media in particular can be fantastic, but also I think it can be a significant drawback to people because people on social media only ever post their successes and how happy they are. What yeah. people don't often realize is that they're looking at a reality that doesn't exist. You know, why is that person so happy? Why is that person so successful and earning so much money? And they think, hang on a minute, why, why aren't I doing that? You know, <laughs> I, am I bad? Am I poor? Am I really, you know, broken? Um, but you've got to remember that social media isn't always reality and each person is fighting their own internal battles, just as you are too. Yeah. And so never compare yourself against other people is, is the biggest kind of single biggest piece of advice that I'd give because you have no idea how, you know, how much pain or how much unsuccess or how much stress a smile can hide. So focus on yourself, loving yourself, loving what you do and having pride in what you do, because whatever job you might be in today or tomorrow. You might not be in it the next week, the week after, or two years later. And that's cool. Yeah. It really doesn't matter because if you're happy and you're trying to be the best of what you can do, then by the very nature is you will progress. It might not be straightforward. There might be downs, there might be ups, there might be sideways. But generally speaking, if you stick to being happy, being the best of what you do and listening to those around you, listening to um, you know, inspirational people, reading, learning, then, then ultimately bit by bit, you will get bigger as a person, better as a person, and more rounded as a person too. Amazing, amazing answer. I uh, will get this out there for, you know, the next generation to hear. Uh, it's very clear. It's about, you know, putting the time in, you know, from what you said and be the best at what you can, you know, uh, be the best at what you do. Uh, and that has served you well. And that's great advice to the young generation. So Mike Jennings, Thank you so much. I also didn't forget the, uh, you know, the uh, competitive drive that you have to challenge me in pickleball. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna make that happen soon. Um, yeah, no, uh, no videos of that one, mate, JJ. Just just <laughs> edit it out so it looks like I've won. <laughs> uh, well, it was great. I appreciate you taking the time, joining us on this podcast, and um, you know, look forward to catching up with you soon, and hopefully see you soon in in the UK in one of your hikes. Absolutely. See you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye, bye. Bye.